Welcome everyone to our webinar today. Uh, my name is Saima Malik. I am the Senior Research and Learning Advisor at the Center for Education at USAID, um, focusing primarily on foundational skills. And I have had the pleasure of working very closely with some of the folks we'll hear from on the webinar today. Um, our topic today, as I know you're all familiar with, is navigating the distance learning roadmap monitoring and evaluating online modalities. At the Center for Education, following COVID-19 and school closures, we have tried our best to respond to some of the needs um, from our programs, but also partner programs on the ground around sort of navigating this new world of distance learning. So at first, there were a lot of questions around how do we do this? How do we pivot from in-person to distance learning? What are some of the modalities that have been tried and tested? What even are some of the terms that are used? So we worked very closely with folks you'll hear from on the call today um, to develop and share some uh, documents, some reports, some guidance tools to help folks through some of that journey. Uh, we had a distance learning literature review that came out earlier on. Um, and that was one that provided an overview and background to the world of distance learning and helped folks to navigate between in-person and online. Shortly after we sort of had that pivot between uh, in-person to online, a lot of questions we heard from our partners as well as from our own programs on the ground were around measurement. And so the next question was, we're implementing these programs, how in the world do we measure whether or not we are reaching our target audience, whether or not they are engaging in the ways that we hope they are? And then finally, of course, are they learning from the programming that we're providing? So the document that we're going to go over today, the, the tool that we have developed uh, together with colleagues on the call, um, who you'll hear from just very shortly, is a roadmap that helps guide folks through this uh, process of measuring distance learning programming. We had a call uh, at the beginning of the week on Tuesday that focused very much on how to measure distance learning programming, programming that's being delivered through radio and television. And the focus, as you all know today on this particular webinar is on online modalities. I see Rebecca Rhodes is putting some of the documents into the chat. The first one is the distance learning literature review, which was the first uh, document that we shared out with uh, colleagues uh, for that intro into the world of distance learning. It's a very rich, wonderful document. If you haven't had a chance to take a look, please take a look and share with other colleagues as well. The second one that Rebecca has put into the chat is the tool that we're going to be talking about today. Um, very quickly, I'd like to present our agenda and then I'll um, uh, get us started here. So um, we are going to first take a look at a roadmap for measuring distance learning video, which essentially is a super short video. It walks us through some of the key findings from the roadmap review uh, tool that was developed that we'll talk more about. After this video, we will hear from Rebecca Rhodes, who is our uh, distance learning lead at the Center for Education, as well as Emily Morris, who's one of the authors of the roadmap itself. And they'll talk us through some of the key points of this tool. After this, we have the pleasure of some fabulous experts in the field joining us today, and they'll be introduced to you shortly, uh, who will have some discussion around some of the key topics and questions that we know you all have in mind, and we'll have some time for question and answer as well. Following key takeaways, we'll have some closing remarks. That's a little bit of the agenda that we have planned for you all today. We're hoping it's going to be a very um, engaging and useful webinar for you all to attend. Um, I would like to mention first off that we, um, this particular webinar and this particular tool is not designed solely for USA programs, but rather for anyone in the field who is grappling with some of these questions. So it is more broad than USA programming. Just want to make sure to uh, present that caveat to you all right at the top here. 
Uh, what I would like to do now is to hand over to our producers of the webinar who will quickly walk us through some of the features of the Zoom call today. So over to Emma Vanettis, who is our lead producer on the webinar. Over to you, Emma. Thank you, Saiba, and welcome everyone. I just want to quickly go over a few of the Zoom tools. So only our presenters today will be on audio. So I do want to bring your attention to the reactions button at the bottom toolbar. Please feel free to provide feedback using those icons throughout the session. At the bottom of your screen, you will also see a live transcription button. If you would like to view closed captioning, click on that button and then select show subtitles. To send a message to the group, you can click the chat button on your toolbar and this will open the chat window. You can type a message into the chat box and if you have any questions during the session, please put them in that chat. And finally, if you'd like to send a message to a particular person, you can click on the drop down next to the to entry point and select the person you'd like to chat. We're happy to have you today and back over to you, Saima. Thanks so much, Emma. And if I could just stress the fact, we know that we have so many questions and there's so much that we wanna discuss on the call today and we have limited time. So I really would love to encourage you all to use that chat feature. Please type your chat questions in the chat. You all uh, did send in questions uh, that we have shared with our speakers on the panel today but please feel free to type in questions as they come up in the chat. We'll make every effort to ensure that those questions are addressed on this call. Um, and if not, we'd like to ensure that we are able to keep in touch with you all and keep the conversation going and reach out afterwards as well. So just wanna really encourage you all to use the chat. I know it's tough not to have the mics on, um, but please use that chat. So what I would love to do at this point is to request that we take a look at this short video. Um, it's not long. It's it's uh, very brief. We understand that many folks on the call may not have actually taken a look or had a chance to take a look at the roadmap for measuring distance learning yet, although we hope that you take some time to do that. But uh, what we have done is put together key takeaways um, and key recommendations that come from that report into about a five minute video. And so it would be really helpful for you all to have access and to take a look at that video first. So I would like to request Emma to uh, go ahead and share the video um, or Nancy, I think is sharing. So thanks so much. The Roadmap for Measuring Distance Learning provides strategies for capturing reach, engagement, and outcomes. This video shares three key strategies and provides an example of how to apply these strategies to one distance learning modality, video programming. As countries around the world closed learning institutions in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a surge in distance learning initiatives. Distance learning is commonly used to reach learners who need flexible learning opportunities, such as working youth, or where schools and learning centers cannot be routinely and safely reached. When implemented intentionally, distance learning can expand learning opportunities. What is distance learning? Distance learning is broadly defined as teaching and learning, where educators and learners are in different physical spaces. Often used synonymously with distance education, distance learning takes place through one of four modalities, radio or audio, television or video, mobile phone, and online learning platforms. Printed texts frequently accompany these modalities and can also be a fifth modality in cases where technology is not used. Distance learning can serve as the main form of instruction or can complement or supplement in-person learning. As countries and education agencies take up distance learning, it is important to design and implement evidence-based and intentional strategies for monitoring and evaluation. This video outlines three interconnected strategies for measuring reach, engagement, and outcomes in distance learning. These include integrated remote and in-person data collection, multimodal technology interfaces, and mixed methods data collection. Using a combination of these strategies will help ensure quality, equitable, and inclusive data. Key strategy number one, integrated remote and in-person data collection. Remote data collection provides timely data on reach and engagement and can be used when in-person data collection is not feasible. 
in-person data collection is preferable for measuring outcomes, including attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors, and where building rapport with learners is critical. Combining remote and in-person data collection enables more frequent, responsive, and systematic data collection in emergency and non-emergency contexts. One example of integrated data collection is measuring learning engagement in video programming using both in-person and remote methods. Key strategy number two, multimodal technology interfaces. Technology interfaces include phone or video calls, interactive voice response, text messages, social media groups, paper, images, video and audio recordings, learning management systems, and educational apps, programs, or games. Measuring distance learning through multiple technology interfaces helps reach a wider group of participants, including those with limited access to technology and connectivity. Interfaces should be selected based on technology device access and accessibility needs, connectivity, and demographics of the users. One example of using multimodal interfaces for measuring engagement in video programming is combining phone calls, social media groups, educational apps, and paper-based protocols to collect data. Key strategy number three, mixed methods data collection. Quantitative data collection methods include surveys, tests and assessments, teaching and learning analytics, and observations. Qualitative data collection methods include qualitative observations, focus group discussions, interviews, and participatory and arts-based research. Combining quantitative and qualitative methods allows for deeper analysis and provides greater opportunity to measure intended and unintended reach, engagement, and outcomes. One example of using mixed methods for measuring engagement in video programming is combining surveys and learning analytics data with focus groups and voice commentaries. Using a combination of integrated remote and in-person data collection, multimodal technology interfaces, and mixed methods data collection will help ensure quality, equitable, and inclusive data. To bring our example of measuring engagement and video programming together, we integrate remote and in-person data collection combine multimodal technology interfaces and mixed methods by using in-person focus group discussions and paper-based surveys, remote phone surveys, recorded voice commentaries, and social media group conversations, and learning and engagement analytics captured through educational apps. For more examples and case studies, and to learn more about the steps in measuring reach, engagement, and outcomes, visit the Roadmap for Measuring Distance Learning. Thank you for sharing that. Hopefully for our participants on the call, hopefully that was useful. We wanted to make sure to show you a distilled version of the three key strategies that are recommended um, and uh, are discussed in much more detail in the roadmap. So again, encourage you to take a look at that roadmap. We do have uh, next are two speakers who are going to talk more about some of the main themes that are discussed in that roadmap document. Uh, I am very happy to hand over to Rebecca Rhodes, who is our uh, Center for Education lead on distance learning, as well as Emily Morris, who is one of the authors of the roadmap, to talk more about some of those main themes. Over to you, Rebecca and Emily. Thank you, Saima, uh, and good morning, everybody. We're very glad to see you here. As we go on discussing the roadmap, please put your questions in the chat, uh, anything you want to ask, and um, we'll, we'll do our best to see what to do with your questions. So we're going to give a brief um, overview of the document now and try to kind of connect it to the questions you've already asked. We can go to the next slide, uh, Emma. So this slide shows you some data about the questions you submitted when you registered. Um, and according to the questionnaire responses that came in uh, from the registrations, a lot of you have questions about the outcomes portion of that trio of metrics that we've been discussing, reach, engagement, and outcomes. 
Um, some of you have some questions about monitoring reach and engagement, but most of the questions we received were about outcomes. So thank you for those. And we'll try to um, go into that in more detail and really try to get at this question you've often asked about what the quality is of how to measure the quality of distance learning programming. Next slide, please. So this wonderful map is really one of my favorite slides in this deck. And the reason is it shows you uh, the countries and contexts that Dr. Morris and Anna Farrell and the team that prepared this roadmap um, really looked at and used data from and information from in, in creating the roadmap. So their approach was to do a sort of, uh, I'm gonna say like a sweep, a kind of light, um, kind of a, a sweep across the world like a lighthouse would do um, and try to see who in the post-COVID context or in the COVID context was using uh, innovative approaches to distance learning and then write those up um, as program experiences and case studies and include them in the annex to the report uh, and then draw from them to create the roadmap and to create the uh, recommendations and the best practices that the, the roadmap contains. So we're just really grateful for all of that work and just impressed with how what is in the roadmap is centered in the actual real life experience across this very broad range um, of contexts. Next slide. So here you have the actual roadmap, uh, which we will continue to uh, discuss and ask questions about. Uh, there are eight steps outlined in the roadmap, as you can see on your slide. Uh, but what we'll talk about today um, and what the roadmap largely focuses on is the first four. Uh, and it provides tools and resources to carry out those first four. And then it builds from there into discussing how the final four could be uh, conducted. Next slide. So the um, steps in the roadmap, as I said, um, are, are clearly delineated. And this is the first one. Um, so this is about determining your objectives in setting up your monitoring, evaluation, and learning plan. And there are really four key internal and external objectives that you'll need to consider and weigh and, and think about the trade-offs between when you're building your uh, own monitoring, evaluation, and learning plan. So there are some internal objectives and external objectives, as you see on the slide, that are possibly where you will want to focus your efforts. Um, internally, uh, you may be looking at how to use data to inform program management, or how to use data to inform teaching and learning, um, or how to guide adapting uh, or even sustaining your programming. And then externally, of course, um, you may be looking at how, do you, how does what is happening in your program contribute to the general global knowledge base about distance learning? Um, how does it further that evidence base? And then what kinds of accountability reporting you have to be involved in in order to justify the funding you receive or possibly scale or replicate your program in the long run? Next slide. So what you'll find uh, with the steps in the roadmap is that each uh, is broken down into some guiding questions and then it includes uh, key recommendations. And so you'll probably be thinking about uh, when you're working with step one of the roadmap, why is distance learning being measured here? And who will, the, who will use the data? Um, who's the audience? And how will the data be used in the long run? Uh, so, so these are all background questions to step one. Um, and from thinking about those, it's possible to go on and participate in steps two, three, four, and so forth. So the roadmap will help ensure that your MEL plan and implementation aligns with um, what you aim to measure and really kind of center you in your main purpose and objectives around your evaluation. And that's the point of step one. Emily, over to you for steps two, three, and four. Perfect, thanks Rebecca. And just to reiterate for step two, we have categorized the metrics into reach, engagement, and outcomes. And these will vary, the metrics will vary depending on the context and the modalities that programs are using. But reach roughly is looking at technology devices, infrastructure, connectivity, engagement is participation in and use of the programming. 
outcomes is change in knowledge, skills, attitudes, behaviors, and teaching and learning. And so the roadmap includes a number of illustrative metrics critical to planning, um, but it also keeping in mind that in, in order to measure quality, using region engagement and outcomes is important using a, a combination of all of these measures. So in the roadmap, the next slide, we have presented some key questions. So how thinking about how are these going to be measured in the programs that you're implementing? What are some examples? How can teams build these measures systematically into monitoring, evaluation, and learning plans? And what kinds of equity analysis should be considered? We also provide the recommendation of using all of the measures as, as feasible and identifying who's being in, reached and engaged and who's not being reached and engaged from the onset. So they're looking at equity from the onset. For the third step, um, oh, and for those of you that are working with USAID uh, programs and funded projects, standard foreign assistance indicator is in draft and that is really just looking at the reach and the percent of learners that are regularly participating in distance learning programming. And so again, that's going to be coming out soon and is just looking at the reach um, aspect of distance learning. The, th the third step is, as you heard in the video, thinking about which measures will be remote, which will be in person, and ideally using a combination of remote and in person where feasible. Some key questions to think about is what is feasible and what is safe, but also thinking about the safety of teams, access to technology, infrastructure, all of these considerations, thinking about equity um, and geographical reach, all of the different equity considerations that need to be taken into account and which technologies will be used, what access is there to uh, technology devices. And key recommendations, again, as you saw in the video, integrating in-person and remote and ensuring marginalized individuals are and groups are included in the data collection. Our fourth step that we go over in the roadmap is really the mixed methods and combining the different types of methods, quantitative and qualitative in the data collection. The key questions that we help users think through are which me what methods can be used, what technologies should be used, and what kinds of equity analysis should be used. And again, mixing methods to collect data that aligns with the, the aims from the step one and the goals of monitoring evaluation and learning and ensuring that data collection efforts are not further marginalizing participants. So the final reiteration, the roadmap is in, in the document and it goes through all these different steps and provides illustrative examples from the case studies that um, and the countries around the world that participated in this uh, evidence gathering. I am now going to move to the section of the exciting section of this webinar where we hear from our experts. So we will be hearing from Mary Burns and Dr. Barbara Means. Mary is an education technology expert based at Education Development Center and works at every level of the online learning landscape. She designs and teaches online courses, evaluates online learning programs for teachers, has developed strategies for education technology and distance learning for schools, for states, universities, ministries of, of education in a number of countries. She advises bilateral and multilateral donors on distance learning and has published popular and peer reviewed articles, book chapters and books on teaching uh, with technology and distance education. So welcome Mary. And we have Dr. Barbara Means who founded the Center for Technology and Learning Research Group and has served as a co-director for many years. Her research examines the effectiveness of innovative education approaches supported by digital technology. Her recent work includes evaluating the implementation and impacts of newly developed adaptive learning software. She is also studying the long-term effects that attending an inclusive STEM-focused high school has for students from underrepresented minorities. A, few, a fellow of the American Educational Research Association, Dr. Means has served on many study committees on the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, including the one currently producing a companion volume to the classic How People Learn. She's advised the US Department of Education on national education technology plans and authored or edited more than a half dozen books related to learning and technology. Barbara earned her degree, her PhD in education psychology from the University of California, Berkeley. So welcome Dr. Means and Mary Burns. And I'm gonna ask them to share for five minutes each some of their insights uh, in response to the questions that you all uh, submitted when you registered for the webinar. And then we will open it up to questions that you have in the chat and other questions um, that you have submitted. 
So handing to you, Mary, and welcome. Great, thank you, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see some familiar faces. Um, I just wanna thank USAID and Encompass for the opportunity to participate in these webinars. I've learned a lot, um, and for the roadmap, which I think is really a valuable service to our field. So special kudos to Emily and to Yvette. And um, I also wanna say just how excited I am to be on the same panel with Barbara Means. She is someone whose work I have consulted for years and she really is just such an expert and we are so lucky to have her with us today. So I'm just gonna use a little bit of my time not to talk so much about technicalities of monitoring and evaluation, but really to talk about distance uh, learning, particularly online learning um, and the roadmap writ large. Um, so I think, um, you know, to begin, I guess I just wanna say that I, I think we know this, um, there's probably no, every, on, every distance technology has its own set of complexities, but I would say that probably no distance technology has as much complexity as online learning, which is really what makes it very powerful, but also makes it rather vexing and challenging for us to use, especially in some of the contexts in which we work. So just briefly, I'll talk about online learning through that lens of reach and engagement and outcomes. So in terms of reach, you obviously need uh, internet access to access online learning, and that's really been a problem in our field for a long time. But the news is good, um, it's getting better. Um, in 2018, 42% of people in the world had access to the internet. In March of this year, that number had increased to 59%. And almost all of that growth is in the low and middle income context in which USAID works. So there's lots of other gaps in terms of usage gaps, connectivity gaps, but at least in terms of actual internet coverage, there is that, that figure is promising. So in terms of engagement and outcomes, again, I think perhaps no other distance education modality is really as diverse or as highly differentiated as online learning. Um, there's incredible divergence, uh, or to use research and evaluation language, there's incredible heterogeneity in terms of online learning. Um, and it really differs in so many different ways. It differs in how it organizes instruction, whether it's 100% online or blended learning or hybrid learning or high flex learning or web facilitated learning. It, it differs in how it's delivered, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous or now bisynchronous. Um, it differs in terms of its delivery systems, whether it's a learning management system or Zoom or a standalone software like Nearpod or Google Classrooms or Hyperdocs or choice boards. Um, it differs in terms of scale. Uh, from one student learning alone to a cohort-based course to a massively open online course where you have tens of thousands of online learners. It differs in formats, whether you have a class or a course or a meeting like this, which is an example of online learning. And it differs in terms of content, and that can be text, games, simulations, multimedia, video, audio, et cetera. And of course, it differs in terms of the hardware that we use to access it, whether it's a smartphone or a tablet or a laptop or a gaming console. Um, so the great news about online learning is that, that it generates tons of front end and back end data that we can use to help with measurement. But I, I belabor this point on the the heterogeneity, because I think when we're measuring things like an engagement and outcomes, it really affects um, in many subtle ways how we do those measurements. So for example, you know, are, are we comparing apples and apples or are we comparing apples and oranges if one group is learning synchronously, but another group is learning asynchronously? Or you know, we, are we measuring an intended competency or a hidden competency. So in other words, if we have a student in a self-paced online course that involves tons of reading, are we really measuring that student's ability to read and comprehend online text? Or is it the actual topic itself? Because sometimes the former gets in the way of the latter. And finally, I think, you know, is the technology influencing the intended constructs we wanna measure? Um, because when we are, evaluating technology, uh, something, uh, something online, we're actually often evaluating subtly the technology which is being used because learning online via phone 
is very different from learning online or a laptop. So I just raised these points um, for reflection and to really um, serve as a bridge to talk about the, the roadmap. Um, because I think the power of the roadmap is number one, it addresses these modalities and these different types of online learning modalities. I think number two, what I really appreciated about it is that Emily and Yvette have helped us make this gentle paradigm shift from um, just monitoring and evaluation face to face to doing it as in a more distance-based way. Because as we scale these online offerings and distance offerings, we will have to do more distance-based measurements. And then finally, um, I just want to express a hope, which is that as, as USAID really formalizes this monitoring and evaluation process around online learning and distance learnings in general, that we begin to build a research base for distance learning in the context in which we work in the global south. Because right now, we don't have a lot of great measurement methods. We don't have a lot of great data. We're still relying on, we're still taking our cues and our information and our paradigms from the global north. So I think I'm hopeful that as we do more of this m and &E around distance education as, as um, furnished through this roadmap, that we can begin to build a research base that really serves our purposes. So thank you. Thank you, Mary, for giving us so many things to think about. I'm gonna act, ask Dr. Means now to speak a little bit. Well, thank you very much. And I wanna thank Mary for really giving that great context and perspective uh, for this work and uh, also echo her praise for the roadmap. I did take a look at it and found it very useful, logical, and accessible. Um, I do want to build on Mary's point about the heterogeneity of online learning. And that does introduce the need to be very clear about what and how we measure. So I would say that the foundation for implementing the roadmap is having a well articulated plan for the distance learning initiative itself. It's, it's what evaluators often call a theory of action. And what this theory of action does is it specifies the intended outcomes, the intended beneficiaries, and the intended nature of the beneficiaries engagement with whatever the intervention that is the learning intervention is. So it's entirely compatible with the roadmap, but you really need to start there both for the design of your intervention, your program, and then for its evaluation. And this is important, for example, in thinking about the many different kinds of online distance learning, because those are gonna influence the nature of the engagement and hence what you measure. So we do find that there are important distinctions between engagement and outcomes typically found in fully online learning experiences and those that are some combination of online and in-person. So we sometimes talk about blended or hybrid or high flex. So that's an important distinction. And there's also an important distinction, I think, between synchronous, that is, uh, where you're having interaction at the same time, even though not the same place, and asynchronous online activities. So in past research, we found rather different outcomes depending on which type you're talking about. So we know that online learning, fully online learning can produce learning outcomes, and in many cases, they're equivalent to face-to-face -face instruction. But there's also data suggesting that weaker students, whether it's because they're younger, they have less preparation, they're more anxious, um, do less well with dis totally distant learning than they would have in a face-to-face -face class. So generally, I'm a propo proponent of trying to do blended learning if you can. Um, and I will talk somewhat about that blended learning advantage um, it can involve the instructor meeting with students face-to-face -face on some days and having students work online, either from home or in a computer lab on other days. That's one form of uh, 
uh, blended learning that's used in many post-secondary courses in the United States, especially math courses. Or it might involve students having a subject matter teacher online and also a teacher or coach or teacher's aide who is with them in person. Um, this latter model, for example, was used in Florida when the state put a cap on class size and many secondary school students didn't have enough qualified teachers. So they had their teacher of record be from the Florida virtual school, which they did online, but they were gathered together with a teacher's aide or a coach in a, a technology lab within their high school. And that was a way to overcome that lack of teachers. Now, when you have these very different experiences and you need to evaluate impact, um, the important thing is you're going to need a comparison or a control group for which you'll have the same measures that you use for your online group. And that's where it gets tricky. This can be difficult. If you're developing your own learning assessment, it has to be fair to students who are not in your particular online learning experience. And it may be difficult to induce a comparison group to actually take the extra assessment, whatever measure you're using. As an alternative, you can look to outcome measures that are automatically or that are already being gathered in your environment. It might be a mandated test for students of a certain age, or it might be uh, whether or not they attend the next uh, course in a course sequence. And when you do that, that gives you a lot of options in terms of being able to find a, a control group without having to go and actually touch them in person, which makes things, uh, which makes things easier. But there can be a trade-off between measuring what you really care about in your theory of action, that is, it might be conceptual learning and the kinds of measures that are automatically gathered for all students. So that's an important decision to engage in as you are planning your program and your evaluation. Um, I would also say, I don't wanna to go too far into the technicalities, but in terms of evaluation design, if you are not in a position to be able to randomly assign people to either take your treatment or be in the comparison group, then you're always going to have to rule out alternative explanations for any positive result you find. And that's part of the reason why it's so important to um, get a measure of students' uh, prior educational achievement or a pretest, because that is so much a predictor of what the outcome is. Other student characteristics, the nature of the experience that students have and their instructors online is very important. And also, uh, as Mary mentioned, um, what technology tools they're using, um, the time they actually have exposure to and their actual learning experience. So that need for qualitative as well as quantitative data is really important as the roadmap, um, as the roadmap describes. Um, so I wanna say, uh, finally, I'll just conclude whether you're doing formative work where you're measuring your own program over time to make it get better, or you're trying to do the more summative work where you say this is the impact of the program. It's important to take an equity lens. I just want to reinforce that part of the roadmap. So to show the data for groups that are important that traditionally have had less access to good learning experiences, you want to make sure they are getting exposure to it, that they are having the same intended experience and that they are having the same intended outcomes. And I'd also say, look to involving those intended beneficiaries in the design of your measures of, ex of engagement and outcomes and actually collecting data. Um, students can run focus groups for other students and they can in fact be wonderful data collectors for you. And it's a way to incorporate their perspectives you learn from them, they learn from the experience, and it's a very empowering thing. We're trying to do this at Digital Promise in a number of our projects, and it's been working very well. So I'll close there. I do have um, a book with a lot more information. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna put it in the chat if people are interested in finding it. Um, I don't get any money from this, but it's not free, I'm sorry to say. Okay, there you go. Thank you so much. And just to reiterate again, we are so grateful and lucky to have um, Mary Burns and Barbara Means here to speak and use all of um, this time to answer your questions. 
that you are starting to enter in the chat. So please keep the questions coming. And just a quick note that speaking to the theory of change and theory of action and the planning out distance learning, there is a comprehensive uh, toolkit for planning um, comprehensive distance learning strategies that lay out some of how you think through theory of change, how do you think through the monitoring at the same time, um, costing that will be coming out before September, and it's a step-by-step -step look at how to plan distance learning programs, um, speaking to a lot of the points that Dr. Means um, uh, discussed, and so that will be shared further before September. So I'd like to start with some of your questions, and one of the questions that has come through is looking at age differentiation, so recognizing that online learning looks differently for higher education and older youth, and depending on technology literacy from early childhood learners who may be using um, technology with parents and caregivers. So could you speak a little bit about how those measurements differ for different age groups um, and any thoughts that you have on sort of the age differentiation and online learning and the different measurement considerations that that leads to. And I'll ask uh, Dr. Means, you can start uh, and, and Mary as well has a lot of uh, thoughts. Sure, I'm sure. sure. Um, well, I will start. I, I do think you can, um, again, this is a time when it's important to uh, work with the designers of the program. So there actually are measures you can embed um, assessments of students' engagement and or their uh, learning actually in the design of, you know, whether it's an app or whether it's some kind of web-based learning experience, even for young children. Um, they make choices when they, they click a mouse and they decide to move something here or move something there. So that has been done and it can be done very successfully. I also think the importance of those qualitative measures um, with young children is really important. Uh, uh, some of my colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Jimena Dominguez in particular, has done a lot of work with the design of early learning in, the, in STEM areas in particular. And they go out and they actually um, work with designers and take the early prototype programs and they study how children and children with their caregivers interact with uh, those particular apps. And oftentimes they learn a lot of things from observation that you would not know just from looking at the data from the app. And so they're able to make sure later that when they take data from the app, it's actually measuring what they think, uh, what the designers intended it to measure. Um, they've also involved um, working with uh, uh, caregivers of young children in, uh, giving them a voice in the design of these learning experiences. And that's proved to be uh, really a value add to the design and quality. Um, hi folks, I'm gonna keep my camera off. Um, I've got workmen in the apartment right now. So um, yeah, I, I'll just add two, two things. One is I think it might be really interesting to take a look at the research that came out of the Xerox Park Institute in the 1970s and 80s, because this is what researchers did. They studied the way young children interacted with technology. And so it led to things like the mouse, um, the graphic user interface, because um, as we know from Jean Piaget, you know, children go through these various stages of learning, one of which is this operational stage where you're kind of touching everything. Um, and the second is I'm just going to um, address the measuring children's behavior with the story from India. I typically work with adults, so I wouldn't really be able to answer this, but um, the question, but <clears throat> um, in India, I worked on a professional development program and we really wanted to assess whether it had any impact or not. You know, we went, we did classroom observations, we talked to teachers and of course everything was wonderful and you know, response bias is real. So what we actually ended up doing to really test whether this intervention was working or not was, um, and we did this in Indonesia with some distance education courses, is we actually brought a group of kids into a room and we started a lesson, but we gave them very scant directions. And we watched their interactions um, and listened to them talk. Um, and, and through that, just by observing them getting into groups, you know, sharing roles, um, the kind of talk that they used, in their groups, the way that they approached a subject area, we were able to see that they, the teachers had actually used a lot of the content from our courses. So it was a really nice um, kind of low invasive 
um, non-invasive and play-based way really to assess um, what, you know, if, if children had learned through their teachers in these online courses. Great, thank you so much. And maybe just building on this, we so that was a great question Anjali posed. Um, Sergio is also talking in terms of in terms of uh, Honduras and trying to collect data and finding it difficult to measure with younger learners and asking about mixed methods. So I'm wondering if you had any follow up thoughts on mixed methods and how do we um, think using mixed methods to involve caregivers and others. Uh, so if you're also working with early childhood or younger learners that you may be also involving others, uh, teachers or caregivers that are involved. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm very high on the idea of involving them in, um, in particularly uh, collecting the qualitative data. And that includes um, listening to their insights about what it is important to measure. And if you can incorporate them into your uh, 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 M&E design um, with some kind of compensation for their involvement, so they're actually um, getting compensated for advising you on your measures, getting trained on how to administer those measures, and then providing you the data. I think that respects uh, their time and respects them and can create to a very fruitful partnership. Um, and just to add, <clears throat> um, you know, we've heard uh, folks on previous webinars here talk about, for example, I think Cleona talking about Ubongo kids where they actually have a camera in the room and they're observing children as they interact with content. You know, a, a great tool at our disposal, a terrific m and &E tool is a cell phone. Mm -hmm. um, and there's all kinds of research, whether it's from, you know, San Francisco United School District, they have a partnership with Stanford that's actually using test, text messaging and just simple messages three times a week to parents to help them get their kids to be ready for preschool. Um, we've seen this in Botswana, um, a previous USAID webinar where Noam Angris talked about the work of, um, is it Young Love or One Love? <laughs> Emily, you have to help me here. One Love is a Bob Marley song, <laughs> Young Love. Is, Young Love. Um, so um, yeah, where they're actually um, using cell phones and interacting with parents. And um, through that, they're able to assess what children are learning. So I, I just think, um, you know, in Honduras, the, this, the rates of cell phone ownership, like many places, is very high, and that's a terrific, terrific m and &E tool. Great. Thank you so much. I'm going to move on to a question from May, and speaking about in context where there is not a robust learning management system, or where teaching and learning communications is, is in different ways, so it could be mobile phone apps, um, text messaging, etc. How can we do data collection that is low touch? In, in a context where there are low uh, incidences of learning management systems and limitations on analytics. I think the general strategy is uh, try to use the technology that is, is available and that uh, learners are using. So um, you, can use, uh, you can use text messages. Um, you can ask for, um, you know, you structure the response. So it's not going to be easy to gather as much data um, as you would if people had access, a better internet access and learning management systems, but it still can be done. And um, more and more of the work is actually um, looking at uh, using mobile devices as data collecting, collection instruments, as Mary indicated. So I, I think there are great strides in this area being made, but more to be made. In, and certainly um, many of you are working in challenging contexts. Um, yeah, you know, to answer that question, I think I'd like to ask a lot of questions. Um, so uh, most online tools, whatever they are, <clears throat> have, they generate some kind of data. Um, you know, there's that famous saying, especially if they're free, that's a famous saying that if, if the technology is free, you are the product. So if you're using an online classroom like Google Classrooms, if you're using, you know, a standalone program like Nearpod, they are generating data. Now, you know, will they share that data is is um, question. Um, but, you know, I guess there is something, and I, I admit, I don't know anything about 
about it. I know very little about it, but increasingly um, online programs are using something that's called an LRS, a learning record store. So I would actually ask you to look that up um, uh, because as I understand it, it's, it's a tool for generating data collection. Although does it have to be with the learning management system? I don't know. Um, one more thing, and this is coming down the road, and this won't be announced until later on, but um, <clears throat> ISTE, which is the International Society of Technology and Education, has been um, working for years on this idea of how do we start to collect um, common data across disparate systems. And so right now, even if something isn't technically online learning, um, you know, most of what we do now is online because of software as a service. Microsoft is now no longer stored. Office isn't on our computer anymore. It's on the cloud. Um, so ISTE has uh, created this um, and they'll be rolling it out. So it's something to look for called a universe. It's, um, I just know the initials, I'm sorry. It's called a UPC. Um, and it is actually something that when organizations get one, they'll actually, like a USAID, they'll actually be able to generate data across a whole range of different types of software platforms, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll just, um, without specifically answering your question, because again, I think I'd have to ask a lot more questions. I think those are two things, that learning record store and then this whole idea of a UPC that will actually allow um, data collection across different platforms, although that's you know a few months away from being unveiled. Right, and I, I think it is farther from being actually operationalized um, in any particular place. So I, I do think it's going to take a while before yeah. we see the benefits of that. It's, you know, it's, it's like the internet access. It's getting better and better. Great strides mm -hmm. have been made, um, but that doesn't mean that everybody has um, uh, what is needed to actually implement it and use it for um, uh, either delivery of learning or monitoring and evaluation. Yeah, so this is the universe, it's a universal product code. I just looked it up as you were talking. Yeah, thanks Barbara for that contextualization. So thank you for um, sharing those questions. And if, if you feel like your question hasn't been sufficiently answered, feel free to ask a, a follow-up question also in the chat and we'll try to help um, answer those even further. So we have a number of questions, including ones from Faison um, in the chat and really looking at what, is, what are the best ways to capture actual usage of programming engagement with the available resources? And maybe to tag onto that, how do we measure time spent on the task, uh, learning tasks in online learning? It's, uh, you know, the uh, most consistent and broadest data you're going to get if you can, in fact, get it uh, from whatever the app is or the learning management system itself. So I talk about back end data. So it's automatically collected. Um, and uh, certainly the more sophisticated applications um, do this and can provide that data to you. If, if you have uh, in signing your agreement or whoever has signed the agreement has made that uh, part of what's what will be available. So you need to make sure that that is in your um, contract because uh, you don't necessarily automatically get it or get it in a form that you can use it. Um, so uh, we have done this quite a bit. You need to arrange your agreement. Um, and uh, we also find that uh, the data that is usually generated um, may not be exactly what you need for your evaluation. So here again, if you can have good relationships with your vendor, your supplier of technology, um, they often are willing to work with you and may uh, give you different data. For example, um, one of the things they typically will do is um, they will give you um, the number of days in which a person logged on. Now that may or may not be something that you can attribute to a particular student or even a particular class, depending on how the login is done. Um, also, it could be that the computer was just left on and nobody was doing anything with it. What you would really like from a evaluation standpoint is you would like to know what particular resources, you, you wanna know what student it was and who the teacher is, what resources were used, uh, and then also the sequence of moves that the student made. So one of the things we found is very predictive, for example, is if a student takes 
a, a quiz on how their understanding of a content area is going, what did they do afterwards if they didn't do well on the quiz? Um, some students will immediately just try it again, hoping by luck they'll hit the mastery criterion. Other students will actually do what the system tries to nudge them to do usually, which is to go back and study the content again. And uh, it turns out that those who have the go back and study the content again behavior tend to do much better in courses than those that just um, either skip it or just try again without any study. So this is something you often have to negotiate uh, to get the meaningful measures out of the system. Again, people are getting much more sophisticated about this all the time. It's getting better and better. Um, <clears throat> to respond to the time question, I guess I'd, I'd approach it from the design end. Um, you know, I know I, I'm guessing, uh, so a big tension of course in online learning is um, that it really is supposed to be more competency or outcome-based versus time-based, but that's the tension we have as we shift from, you know, a brick and mortar system to a much more online system. Um, so I think there's a few things that um, you can do to make sure that the time that you're ascribing to an online course actually is the real time. And so some of these things are easy. So for example, if you create a video, um, the video has an automatic time, you know, four minutes and 34 seconds, or if you create a multimedia application, same thing, two minutes, et cetera. It gets a little bit trickier with things like readings because you don't know typically how long it takes someone to actually do a reading um, or you know, answer a discussion question. So what I would say is um, I think this really, really speaks to the absolute importance of making sure, um, especially for USAID people, that when people are designing and implementing online courses in your programs, that there is a piloting. Um, because what you want is you want someone to go through, when I design courses, I get user tests, testers, and I actually have them write down how long every single thing takes. And then I combine the hours and add 20% to it. And, and that's kind of the time. I, I feel like that's really the best I can do. Um, but yeah, you can't get actual time on the back end unless you actually know what the time is on the front end. That's a design mm -hmm. issue. And again, I think if you are using a learning management system, that's really the beauty of it. Um, because <clears throat> um, it can track how long you spend on something. And if you're using time as a proxy for completion, then you can set your course designer can set up the LMS to make sure that the student has to watch the whole video um, in order to get credit. It's harder to do with the reading or they have to do this discussion in order to get credit. And of course you can also build in um, uh, assessments um, within whatever the learning materials are and those uh, interim assessments um, and the sequence of scores on them um, are very useful uh, outcome and engagement measures. Thank you so much. So I just want to reiterate um, what I heard from both Barbara and Mary is thinking and thinking about the design and measuring the design stage. Um, and thinking about analytics takes negotiation with the different agreements that you may have with the different um, software and um, tech companies that you'd be working with is really negotiating those and thinking about the data from the onset. So just wanted to reiterate those points. Um, we had another question from Pragya about how do we measure learning in absence of standard assessment? So when, um, during the transition to co in COVID and having to go online very rapidly, how do we test that when we don't have necessarily treatment and control group? And I wanna just say from our learnings uh, from the panel on Tuesday, that also thinking about formative assessments versus summative assessments is really important. Formative informing teaching and learning that are not necessarily for accountability purposes and don't need to have the same reliability and other measures that we need to have because those are for teachers and informing teaching and learning or caregivers versus the summative, which are the ones that we're talking about more that need um, to be more thought about in terms of reliability. And I don't know if um, Barbara or Mary, you have anything to add on to that of how do we measure? And I guess my question back to Pragya would be, are those for, do you need to measure for formative purposes for the teacher to know what's happening and for well-being of students? Or are you, are you being asked by a ministry or department of education to be reporting on, because those are two different types of 
assessment for things. And so maybe Mar Barbara, you have something you want to contribute to that question. Well, I, I would just say you made a very important distinction. I think both the the formative assessments are very helpful in uh, they're helpful in promoting the students' learning. So it's a good thing to have included in your um, your learning design. It's also very helpful for you in improving your your program. Even as it's going on, um, you can look and see are there certain concepts or areas where students are struggling or maybe it's a subset of students. And then you wanna look at uh, whether you need to have additional experiences or a different approach for those students that need to return to the material a second time. Um, in terms of uh, the summative assessments, uh, if I could wave a magic wand, it would be um, something that actually is taken from multiple points in time and you add up the progress on the formative assessments and then you create some kind of summative outcome measure. And we wouldn't have to have the external, um, I have a colleague who calls them the drop in from the sky assessments. But most of us live in a world where there's an education system that for accountability purposes wants those drop in from the sky assessments. So um, I do encourage you to look at those. The advantage is that uh, probably you can get a comparison group that has to take them as well. It may be that they're just parts of them that are relevant to your particular learning program. So if your learning program, for example, is on um, maybe the very basic skills in uh, mathematics, maybe that's the portion of the uh, summative assessment you want to look at. Often there are scales for subsets of the formative or of the summative assessment or it may be you're you're focusing on the conceptual part of learning and then that'll be a problem solving scale on the summative assessment so the advantage of those is you can get comparison group um, they're widely regarded within uh, political contexts as being important um, another thing i would say um, is think about possibly using um, life outcome measures um, as your criterion. Um, and those can be things like um, the student stays in school for the next year. Um, so sometimes those are relatively simple to gather, but they're absolutely critical for uh, the welfare of individuals. Thank you so much. And maybe I'll tag onto that question with another question we had was on how do we also measure social emotional? So these life outcomes and social emotional learning uh, in an online space. And then there's a question about uh, from Anjali about target setting. When we're asked to set targets on reach engagement outcomes, how do we know uh, responsive targets to set for our, our different outcomes? And then, um, uh, maybe I'll take the first and, and um, let Mary have the second. And I'm, I, it sounds like I'm punting, but I will say that on those socio-emotional um, outcomes, there has been a lot of work in this area recently. And um, I put in a, uh, a link to a website uh, from the, collaboration, the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. They have a whole set of instruments um, and a guide to using them. These have been used in prior research. So many of them do have uh, some reliability and validity data. Um, you can look to those. I would, uh, I would caution that uh, this work was done uh, predominantly in the United States. I think there are probably other resources from other countries. Um, some of these things are cultural in many ways. So that pilot, that pre-testing that Mary talked about, I think is really important if you're translating one of these instruments to pre-test it in your language and culture you're working in. Um, I was hoping Barbara would take the second question. So <laughs> <laughs> not the first question, um, but no, just I'll piggyback on that to say that, yeah, this is, this is um, there is a lot of work being done on this and this is um, an area that people are struggling, but also there's, uh, you know, I think a lot of really interesting stuff happening, certainly at the international level. And, you know, one way in terms of looking at um, social emotional learning 
is to use game-based approaches. So that's not necessarily to create a game because some of those are very simple, as you know, like what's the capital of Burkina Faso, but um, much more, you know, simulations, game-based principles where students have to, you know, solve a problem, you know, an, an example that people might know is this whole notion years ago of um, something like SimCity. Um, so you have to solve a problem, you're confronted with roadblocks and you have to persist. And just the fact that you kind of get through and create something is kind of is a proxy measure for persistence. You can add to those measurements through facial recognition systems that, you know, look at um, your frustration, which is a form of engagement, your, your interaction, whether you give up, etc. Um, and, and, you know, increasingly people are using more and more things like artificial intelligence to kind of start to look at social emotional learning. And then you can use technology, I think, as part of kind of a larger problem-based or project-based activity. And, and maybe it's not the technology that you're measuring. And now I'm really talking about in-class uses of technology, but it's much more the whole instructional design itself. Um, you know, are students cooperating? Are they collaborating? Are they flexible? Are they persisting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, so in terms of the target setting, how do we know how to respond to a target? I, you know, that's another question that I'd want to answer with a lot of questions. I guess, you know, in our work, wherever we work, it's context, 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 right? Location, location, location. I mean, I would say that we try to design targets that are realistic in the context in which we work in terms of, um, you know, people's literacy levels, their numeracy levels, their years of schooling, their access to schooling, their access to technology. So I apologize if that's not a good answer um, and happy to follow up, but um, I just answer it that way. Barbara, I don't know if you wanna add anything to that. No, that I- non That non-answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's, um, you know, it. it's, often the case I find as an evaluator, um, uh, I, I go in and I, and whoever the funder is who wants the summative data, sometimes they have expectations um, that I think are unrealistic. Um, I try to bring prior research and discuss with them, you know, what would you really expect by that time um, but it, it is something you have to be careful of, um, and you can't always win over, um, you know, win over the uh, funder. I, I do try to make sure I'm building in um, some measures that um, maybe are somewhat less ambitious, uh, but you, you know, you measure a couple of different things and measure some outcomes that in retrospect, they'll be happy they had that other measure too, because it will show something good, even though they didn't get the miracle that they thought would occur in the first iteration of their program. Um, so I guess that's all the advice I can give is, is you know, you, where you have a choice, you try to um, negotiate some of those things, build in some um, fallback positions and redundancies in your data. Great, thank you so much. And I love the reiteration of setting targets based on evidence and learning. And so one thing that we have also learned from the different groups and we reiterate is going back to those measures and going back with data as, the, as you collect data as well and reforming and thinking about targets as an ongoing process as well. So thank you for those points. I have two more points from some of the questions that were submitted. Um, at the beginning about quality, how do we measure quality of online learning? And then I have a, a question related to cost benefit and, and knowing cost benefit trade-offs for different types of online and any thoughts you either of you have on those two issues. So quality and then cost benefit. Well, um, quality, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 no you no, start, no, no. <laughs> no, I, I mean, you know, I, I would just say in terms of quality, um, first, you know, just standards or criteria for quality. Um, and you have to have those for, I would say everything. You have to have them for the content, for the instruction, for the assessment. Um, you know, these can be international standards, they can be locally developed ones. And then I think you have to develop checklists and rubrics to assess your online program for these standards of quality, for rigor, for fitness. Um, 
I think you have to make sure that the quality of outcomes of the educational experience is consistent between modes. I mean, frankly, I find there's a lot. So now, you know, before COVID, online learning kind of meant one thing, which was a learning management system. <laughs> After COVID, it means it means Zoom. But um, I'm, I'm talking LMS LMS period, um, BC before COVID. I mean, oftentimes what we did was we really worked on um, asynchronous thing, or synchronous learning and left kind of asynchronous out there, let them figure it out on their own. And we, and we can't do that. So you have to make sure that you have um, consistent quality of outcomes. And then you have to systematically collect and analyze this. I, I would say, especially student feedback is a real core component of academic quality assurance mechanisms. So yeah, paying attention to these products, to these processes, to production delivery systems. You know, universities will often have quality assurance systems uh, for online learning, but our donor programs often do not. And I think we need to. In terms of the second one, I'll just, um, I, I know Elena is on this call because I, um, and she gave what I think with all due respect to every CIS presentation I've been to possibly the best presentation I've ever been to where she talked about the difficulty of doing cost benefit analyses um, and return on investment stuff. So I'll, I'll leave that to Elena um, because that's her area of specialty and she's at USAID so you can talk to her. But I think we really can't measure that whole idea of cost until we know the whole total cost of ownership of online learning. And I don't think that's something that we do in donor funded programs, there's so many costs associated with online learning that we really have to capture before we can start making determinations about um, cost benefit. So I'll stop there. Great, and maybe I can ask Emma or Lena to drop the link to the cost benefit information that USAID has in the chat. Um, also just a note too that IMEE, uh, Anjali has dropped some of that information in the chat for those of you um, that are thinking about cell or measuring cell. Um, also, just a note that the toolkit will have some guidance that Alina's team has developed on costing of distance learning. So in that forthcoming document, there'll be some guidance as well. I want to get to Musa's question about what kind of metrics in terms of online engagement and reach can we share with a national, so a national le level uh, education management information system. So national level data that can go into kind of government systems on measuring engagement and reach in online. And do you think we can do predict predictive analytics with this kind of data. Barbara, you wanna start? I'll try. I'm not sure I know the context for this well enough to say anything um, terribly uh, intelligent. I, I do think um, that it may be possible to define indicators for um, online, in participation in online learning experiences. So you could provide an indicator. Um, for example, some states in the US have said that um, every student has to take a, uh, an online course and earn credit in it to get a uh, secondary school diploma. So that's a requirement that some states have uh, put out there. So that would be fairly simple and straightforward. Um, in terms of doing, uh, uh, sharing more uh, or something that's deeper than having taken the course, I guess, a certain kind of outline. Um, it's, it's hard for me to imagine that from such a decentralized system that I live in, um, that there would be something that would end up in a national database. Um, but some countries may be in a different situation than that. Yeah, and I'm by no means an expert on EMISs, but I would say, um, uh, I'm not gonna let my ignorance stop me from addressing this question, but um, <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering if most of the data generated through a learning management system would even be useful in mm -hmm. an EMIS, because my understanding of when I've seen EMISs in places where I've worked, they're really measuring much broader mm -hmm. Constraint. I mean, they're looking at grades, registration, student ID, where you live, et cetera. So I don't know. You know, I don't know if if that sounds good, but maybe it wouldn't. There'd be it might be a little bit ill-fitting. But you know, in theory, you could put anything in an EMIS. Um, the question is, why would you? Because if you have too much data, it just becomes data overload, it, and it's it's un unwieldy and expensive. I, now, what we do a lot is connect EMIS type data 
with data from a learning management system, because the EMAS will give you, for example, um, a prior achievement measure, and it will give you things like, um, it might give you, in, in the US, it gives you poverty level, and it gives you race, ethnicity, it gives you gender, um, it'll tell you what schools the student has attended and so on. So in terms of having uh, models where we have the more specific information about engagement with the online learning and the learning outcomes from the uh, learning management system, but we have all of these predictor variables from the EMAS, now that turns out to be um, quite feasible and, and that's, that's uh, kind of normal practice. You have to get the agreement to get the EMAS data and de-identify individual students and so on. So it's not simple, but it's uh, very doable and commonly done. Um, and then in terms of the second one, which I've kind of forgotten about the predictive analysis, um, you know, that's, um, yeah, education has been datafied um, and everyone's very excited about big data. So, um, you know, the question is why are you using the predictive analysis? Is it for benchmarking? Is it to start um, making these, you know, for inferences, which is really where you start getting in trouble? Um, is it for, you know, working on adaptive learning systems or, you know, helping a company, technology company in your country get information so it can create more software. But um, <clears throat> I mean, my understanding of, um, of using predictive ana um, analytics is first of all, you need a lot of historical data. Um, you need good data and you need it at the individual and at the aggregate level. Um, and, you know, then why are you using it, I guess would be another question. I think the third thing then is then you, you really need people who are skilled in these kind of artificial intelligence techniques, whether it's kind of the old fashioned rules based AI, or what we see more of now, which is kind of the machine learning, the artificial neural networks, um, which is just so complex. Um, and so, you know, to two comments on that. And number one is, uh, this is something I think we're going to have to start addressing in donor projects, is this amount of data that we're collecting on people, especially with the, the amount of data breaches and ransom attacks. I mean, there's a whole ethical question about why we're collecting data on students. What are we using it for? Um, and is it being used for purposes that they don't benefit from? And then the other is, I think we have to be careful about AI as exciting as it is. Um, you know, I, if any of you have students, uh, your children were in an international baccalaureate school last year, I think it was, they use predictive analytics to, to do the international baccalaureate grading. Typically that's, those are done by human beings. Um, and it was just a giant snafu. Um, because the grades were far lower than were predicted um, using AI, using predictive analytics. Um, and it created a huge outcry. Um, and this happened too in Scotland and England with the GCSE exam. So the predictive analytics stuff is very exciting and we're seeing it being used a lot in intelligent tutoring systems and personalized learning. Um, it's not surefire and um, it raises some ethical issues. So I've gotten way, way away from the question, I think. So Barbara, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Well, I would just uh, add perhaps, I, I think you have to be, you do have to be really careful if you start pulling in things like um, uh, uh, race and gender into your predictive models. Um, and then it, it, it can end up being kind of, it can create a I don't want to say a self-fulfilling prophecy, but it, it can actually not be to the benefit of the people you're talking about. If you're actually trying to predict outcome in courses, and this is this was tried in the United States and a lot of colleges. Um, if you're actually trying to predict outcomes in courses, you can do a good job just by having a diagnostic assessment at the beginning of the course or some prior learning measure. And um, uh, that captures a, a whole lot of the, um, variability and, and really helps you with the prediction. If the purpose is um, for seeing kind of who you should watch out for and make sure that they get um, support during the course. But I just would 
double underscore what Mary said about making sure that the reason you're doing it is going to help people rather than um, um, uh, isolate or marginalize learners. Thank you so much for all of your great questions and to Barbara and Mary for answering and providing answering information for all of you that have provided information in the chat as well. Um, we have reached time and I want to make sure that Rebecca can sort of bring us to the takeaways from this session. I'm going to ask um, Mary and Barbara in the chat in response to one of the questions that um, Anne asked in the chat is could you provide in the chat two areas that you would like to see more data and evidence on and on so two wish areas that you have while we hand back to Rebecca to bring us. Emily, to sorry, I didn't hear the whole question. You broke up. What was it again? What are two areas you would like to see more data and evidence on in online learning? And I posted that in the chat. And if you could just in the chat kind of think about two areas, um, Barbara and Mary, that you think um, you would like to see. And I'm going to hand off to Rebecca to take us to the table. Rebecca, back to you. So Barbara and Mary are putting their thoughts in the chat and I'm gonna invite Rebecca to share the takeaways. Can you hear me now, Emily? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, that's great. Um, I wanted to very quickly um, thank everyone, uh, both our presenters and our participants for this fantastic exchange of information. Um, it's been a really rich discussion, so I don't know if I can actually summarize it. Um, we've covered a lot of ground. I wanted to go ahead, I'm hoping most of you can see what I'm projecting here. Um, in the roadmap document itself that we've recommended to you this morning, uh, on pages seven and eight, you have a series of metrics um, that you can that you can use and think about and um, pick from once you've defined the purposes of your monitoring and evaluation plan uh, to really kind of try to unpack some of these questions both around outcomes and then reach an engagement that we've been discussing. And I think what we've heard this morning is that um, you know it's really a process of using everything at your disposal to try to find a way forward to, to measure what you're most interested in measuring. I think Mary gave us a really good sense of how hopeful and, and kind of evolutionary things are right now, that things are changing fast on the ground and getting better and better by the day um, from a technology perspective. And I think Barbara um, reminded us that, you know, there are all these considerations around what you're doing um, when you're measuring, uh, that you have to really think carefully, not only about the metric you're sort of pursuing or counting, but um, how you're framing it, um, you know, how you're getting that data, who's getting the data, how it could be equitable in the process of getting the data, um, and how you could uh, be sure that the whatever um, method or device or technology you're using is, is reliably providing that data to you. Um, we also heard a lot in our discussion um, about the sort of variety of situations that we face on the ground and, and how these things have to evolve over time. You have to sort of continue to learn how best to learn about whatever you're doing in distance learning. Um, and I think that was a, a theme that came through strongly from both presenters. Um, and then I think... Uh, I would contribute, Emily, just one thought before I hand it over to Saima, which is I think you have to, you know, have the courage to sort of start on this work um, and, and design from the beginning, start early, have your mail plan designed up at the top of your work so that you're able to um, keep shaping, framing and adapting it as it goes along. But don't, you know, do, don't make that mistake of waiting too long to uh, begin to think about which parts of the roadmap or which kinds of metrics or which activities or devices or modalities you're going to use to get your data, try to have that planned and, and ready and available to roll at the same time that your intervention is designed, planned, and ready to roll. Um, so I think <laughs> 
that does not do justice to the discussion we've had, um, but I think that would be some of the main takeaways that I would focus on. I really encourage everyone to look at the roadmap document and I'm gonna hand it over to Saima again with great thanks to participants and presenters to close us out. Thanks so much. Yes, uh, thank you so much to everyone who the presentation, uh, Barbara Means, and a special thank you to Emily Morris and our production team, to James, for helping to put this together. I just wanted to do an ending save with you um, for the documents. It has put together a number of documents that we um, would like to go ahead and share the links for in the chat here. If you haven't had a chance to, there are several additional distance learning materials that might be of interest to you and colleagues. Please take a look at the site that uh, uh, is in the chat right now. And we invite you to continue the conversation. If you have questions, if you'd like to continue this discussion with us, please reach out for questions um, and further discussion. We hope to share the link to the video that we showed at the top of this webinar shortly. Um, and so please keep a lookout for that, as well as the distance learning toolkit that Emily had mentioned earlier in the webinar, which provides um, an overview of how to put together a comprehensive distance learning strategy that can be embedded within an education system. So it would be very useful for colleagues who are working closely with ministries of education currently. Please keep an eye out for that. We hope to continue this discussion with you all. And again, thank you so much for joining today. Thank you to our presenters, our panelists, the production team, and uh, we hope to see you all soon. Thanks so much. Have a wonderful rest of the day, rest of the evening, wherever you are.